Welcome everyone to another edition of the MLS Hour, Virtual Legislative Edition. Uh, we wanted to bring you industry and legal updates, so we have a great lineup for you today. And to get us started, I'd like to turn it over to Rodney Gancho for introductions. Rodney? Thanks, Renee. Um, so we got a uh, wonderful lineup here of individuals that would typically give updates at the different legislative policy meetings. Uh, so we uh, asked them if they would because of the condensed schedule of our NAR virtual uh, legislative meetings, uh, provide this recorded update so that it could be shared uh, and they can pass along that great information that they usually do. Uh, the first individual that we have addressing our group today is Ron France. Ron is the Vice President of Industry Relations uh, with RPR. Ron was, a uh, fun fact about Ron, Ron was part of the initial rollout team for Realtor.com. Realtor.com. Uh, Realtor.com was launched way back when in November 26, 1996. Uh, and uh, if you didn't know, prior to Realtor.com, it was called the Realtor Information Network, uh, which was launched the year before. So uh, a long time since then, a lot has happened and even more so uh, in recent time here. So Ron, let's turn it over to you and please share with us what's uh, new, what's the latest and greatest with uh, RPR. All right, excellent. Thanks, Rodney. Well, I'd like to start by thanking the NAR MLS engagement team for in the invitation to participate in the 2020 virtual MLS forum. Uh, RPR is proud to be an NAR member benefit and part of the NAR group of technology solutions. RPR just celebrated a milestone anniversary. This year we passed the 10 year mark. In a non-technology world, it would be like celebrating our 100th birthday with Al Roker. As you can see, much of our data is now tracked into millions or hundreds of millions and even billions. Obviously, with that much data all in one place, statistical analysis becomes the primary function. RPR reports generated continue to climb annually with an increase this year of 2.1% over 2019. Our users are steadily moving to mobile. Desktop sessions went from 74% to 67% in 2019, while mobile sessions went from 22% up to 29%. 53% of growth in user sessions last year came from mobile. As you can see, our mobile sessions are up almost 44%. In fact, 67% of RPR usage has moved to mobile. RPR is fortunate to have exceptional MLS partners. While all realtors have access to the RPR platform, 94% also have their MLS data included. RPR is proud to offer realtor members a technology platform that supports their needs for statistical analysis, designed in a way that is easy to navigate and packaged into beautiful reports buyers and sellers can use to make for informed decisions about sometimes complicated transactions. You can see our use of statistics mirror the fact that more realtors annually continue to find RPR one of their go-to tools. So, given the current environment we're experiencing, I thought I would offer some statistics RPR is seeing nationally. In March 2019, RPR had over 1.5 million active listings. This March, we saw a drop of 10.4%, which is unprecedented in a spring market. We'll have April's numbers in a few days, but we expect to see the trend continued. Pending status experienced an interesting lag in momentum with a 27% increase in listings waiting to close over the year before. The other observation is the fact local municipalities office have been closed, creating the possibility for a lag time in public record data reporting as well. Beginning around the middle of March, we started receiving requests from various MLSs asking for changes to our display. The most prominent was a request to disable open house display. This was followed by new data fields for virtual open houses and some MLSs offering a new on hold status, <clears throat> uh, 
which would stop the calculation, <coughs> pardon me, of days on market. <laughs> Thanks. Most of these requests happened in the first two weeks while members were being mandated to stay at home. <clears throat> Most associations and MLSs took to private social media platforms to broadcast industry news and offer new virtual training opportunities. The RPR industry relations team launched a six week campaign offering training options organizations could easily post to their various platforms. We're seeing posts like these on association pages across the US. P.S. We love the fact this post was liked 5,600 times in Northern Virginia. <clears throat> in April, the RPR training department started a four week COVID-19 webinar series, which was promoted in many ways, including via association social media platforms. The response was amazing. We just continue, we just completed the final installment. For all four sessions, we had over 7,000 registrations and almost 3,500 unique attendees. This is the highest number of registrations for any single series that we've offered. So with that, I'll say thanks again to everyone on the NAR MLS engagement team for the invitation. And now I'll turn it back over to you, Rodney. Thanks a lot, Ron. Great information. Next in our lineup is Sam DeBoer. Sam is the CEO for the Real Estate Standards Organization, otherwise known as uh, RISO. Sam is the epitome of that guy, they say, needs no introduction. In Sam's case, it couldn't be truer. Uh, he has engaged in all aspects and continues to engage in all aspects of the industry, from a recovering broker, uh, to financial involvement, uh, to technology, volunteerism, and he's often an industry commentator for a number of different publications. Uh, Rizzo just concluded the first ever Rizzo Remote last week. Uh, from all accounts, it was a tremendous success. So I hope that Sam's uh, gonna share some of that and uh, the other great things that Rizzo's doing. So Sam, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rodney. And I was gonna share my slides right away, but I thought this would be appropriate for these kinds of business days. My wife just showed up with soup and sandwich, obviously has no idea that I'm on live camera right now, but I kind of can't complain right now. You might've seen me waving my, uh, <laughs> eyes a little bit there for a second earlier, but we'll, uh, we'll move over to the presentation. Thank you for that uh, introduction. So uh, what we really wanna be talking about right now at RISO is how we're communicating value um, to, to our members and how you as, since this is an MLS focused crowd, are communicating value uh, to your brokers and agents. You know, I could go and list off all kinds of certification facts like we might do in a normal year, um, but really what our focus is and hopefully your focus can be is explaining very clearly to your members how you're helping their business in this tough market right now. So what, what, we're, uh, what we're focusing on right now is being able to say what RISO does with MLS is in a valuable way for brokers. Um, this is a tough concept. We know this is a tough concept for um, explaining to a broker, explaining to an agent. Um, but we've really been focusing our communications at RISO uh, over the past year on this, and we think it can be a big benefit for MLSs as you're working with your folks as well. Um, and the end of the day, the benefit is efficiency. This is what the intent of RISO was, was to bring efficiency to your technology. Uh, brokers are the primary uh, beneficiaries of that efficiency, and MLSs are delivering that to their brokers and to their agents. So, so what does that mean in terms of boots on the ground for the folks that you're working with? Well, it means saving time and money. There's nothing more that people are looking for right now than bringing more efficiency to their business, um, having better technology tools at lower cost. So um, for those folks who are looking to uh, be able to do more work remotely, be able to focus more on their clients and their business and less on trying to make technology tools work together, less on trying to bring data from all kinds of different inaccurate data sets together, um, you as an MLS organization can talk to them about all the tools that you provide, what those do for them, and why they have access to maybe data across broader markets, whether it's data shares, whether it's data that flows across tools, 
we don't even have to say data because people sort of bug out uh, sometimes when you start talking about data standards, but it's important that they know that the work that MLSs are doing with RISO is to provide that efficiency for them and is to provide that, that as, a, as a business benefit so they have better property information across their tools. So besides our, our internal communications work uh, that we've been working on, what, what you all know and understand because you work with us at RISO is you know, the two core components of the many different services we have that are the data dictionary and the web API. But being able to tell membership why these are a benefit to them and how they continue to improve is basically understanding that it's a universal language, that the dictionary is a dictionary. It's got the terms and definitions for your data. And the way we transport or share that data is through the web API, formerly RETS. But that's how we communicate data between systems. This is probably old hat for a lot of you. Um, but it's important that we really focus on exactly how we say that so the average broker or agent can understand it. And we have over 800 member organizations who are a part of supporting that. So this is more of a newer update. Um, we've been working with all kinds of organizations across the industry. Um, and, and those who are on the call today actually, RPRRealtor.com, CMLS have all been supporting us with, of course, NAR in terms of bringing the best data about the industry together. So we've just released this map um, where you can see what the MLS marketplace looks like live uh, up to the minute any day when we get an update from anyone. You'll see slightly different variations than you might see on an MLS map from a, an RPR or a T360, um, different ways of analyzing these sorts of things. But for our purposes, it's so that we can show brokers and agents where they can get great quality data and where they can depend on an MLS who is doing the work to support standards um, and see that they've got updated data and that's available. So we think this will continue to be a, a more and more robust resource as we add more and more information about what an MLS data model might look like, about the amount of data available. Uh, but it's something you can take a look at at reso.org. Um, just click on certification up top and you can see this. But it also points out some of the other things that tie in, which are um, you know, the OUID, the UPI, all of these unique identifiers, which you may not have spent a lot of time digging into, but are now getting integrated into your technology software's platform. So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, um, but, but it's exciting to be able to bring this because we've got so much momentum on bringing a clean data set to the industry on uh, MLS data. So you can also download it. We've got it open for anyone who'd like to get this information. So um, right below that map, you'll see a download link. You can open up a spreadsheet maybe something you want to use in your strategic planning, maybe something that you just want to use for some other sort of business reference, but we want it to be available and we want to get your feedback. If you see something in this list that's wrong, we want you to let us know because it's important that we keep this list updated and clean, but also that it's available to the entire real estate community. There's no secret sauce in here. It's just information, um, but it ties back to things like, as you can see, the OUID, the organizational unique ID. We should be able to tell at the broker or agent level or any technology provider, when you get data in, you should know exactly where that organization, or who the organization was that sent that through, whether it's through a data share, a single broker feed, a single MLS feed, et cetera. So that's really a big part of what we're working on now is broadening those data services um, that we can offer to the industry and bringing more transparency to what the data marketplace looks like. Uh, and these are, are those newest things that we're working on, you know, unique IDs to clean up the industry's data and get accuracy. And again, we've had some huge support um, from RPR, uh, Realtor.com has been part of our meetings supporting that as well as NAR. In terms of making sure we can identify organizations, people, and properties in every data set we have in the industry, there's no reason that this industry can't clean up those very simple, straightforward parts of data but it requires a community effort. It requires a whole lot of folks to get involved in that. So the latest um, is the unique licensee ID, which is simply being able to identify an agent, a licensed agent in any data set across realtor marketplaces, across non-realtor marketplaces, um, and Northwest MLS and RMLS in Portland have a pilot on that right now. We would love to bring in more MLSs who might be interested in joining that effort in terms of cleaning up industry data. So if that's something you're interested, um, we'd love to bring you in. 
as it stands right now, 99% of realtors, actually over 99% of realtors, have access to RESO certified data in their MLS marketplace. So we really are on the precipice of doing some big things there and moving into um, you know, some, new, some new areas like this with our unique IDs where we can really add to the data dictionary and add to the web API uh, and bring a lot more focus to those for the industry and continue to uh, accelerate their growth. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to getting any feedback we can from you and uh, including you as much as possible. And if you need any help in terms of communicating from MLS to broker to agent and consumer, what that value is that you're providing, uh, we'd be happy to uh, talk to you anytime about that. Thanks, Sam. And thanks to Rizzo for the important work that you guys are doing to move the industry forward. Thank you. Next up, we have Mark Allen. Mark is the Vice President of Association Industry Relationship or Relations for Realtor.com. Mark, can you believe it? You've been at it for over five years in that position. Prior to that, Mark was the CEO uh, for the Minneapolis Area Association. And for the, there, he was 16 years plus. So I guess that means we have you for another 10 years in the, the current position. Uh, Mark, we'll turn it over to you to talk about uh, Realtor.com and uh, some of the great things that you guys are doing recently. Well, thank you, Rodney, for the, uh, the introduction and uh, to you and Renee and NAR for allowing us this opportunity to speak uh, to the Realtors that all of us work hard to serve. Um, I'd like to echo David, Dr. Rowe's sentiments uh, a few days ago and, and say that, you know, we all are in this together and our, 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 we consider everybody part of our Realtor.com family and we sincerely hope uh, the best for you and your families. Um, Realtor.com is here for you. Um, obviously, these are uncertain times for everyone and we're probably all getting tired of those catchphrases. Uh, but know that our goals are to support Realtors and consumers uh, who we all serve uh, through this current market shift that we're all dealing with right now. Um, we're doing at Realtor.com all we can to help evolve the new paradigm um, for the real estate transactions moving forward. And I'm going to be spending some time today outlining um, the things that we're doing, uh, many of which are new um, and many of which are, uh, most of which are available for free actually, and some can be used as services that associations, the MLSs and brokers bring forward as well. Um, and uh, we do want people to know um, as a demonstration of our sensitive sensitivity to um, our realtor partners and their current circumstances. Um, you probably know we have provided relief uh, and greatly reduced um, RDC marketing and lead generation fees through mid-May. Uh, so we are sensitive to that um, and um, we'll be communicating plans moving forward. I want to first spend some time talking about um, things that are important to our marketplace relative to virtual marketing experiences. Um, we have been busy emphasizing over the past several weeks um, some new tools and features. One is Photo First, uh, which provides for consumers. Um, we are able to use artificial intelligence to know what they're looking at. And if kitchens are important, they're gonna, the photo first plan is gonna show them kitchens first. If the curb appeal is important, they'll see that first, uh, master bedrooms, et cetera. Obviously, map overlays are critically important to help understand community issues that are at play. Um, so we've really had a focus on emphasizing that uh, to both our realtor and consumer audience. But we are also emphasizing, <clears throat> excuse me, realtor communications that don't require face-to-face -face interactions. And you're all full aware of that. Um, video chats, text, emails, most of these are not new tools, uh, but they're more emphasized now than ever before. And we tried to make it more um, uh, interactive and accessible right through our applications. We've got a real big focus on helping agents and brokers to upload uh, more consumer content on realtor.com. Um, and so um, that uh, also is important to us. Um, we are um, um, uh, working to make certain we get uh, virtual tour feeds from all associations and emphasizing the use of uh, video and virtual tours um, for those MLSs that are not providing those feeds. Uh, we're trying to get those feeds. 
um, for those MLSs that cannot provide those fees, we're sharing with realtors how they can um, upload virtual tours through their realtor.com professional dashboard. And um, we also are um, very active in sharing uh, tutorials um, on how to use realtor.com professional dashboard and tips and advice for producing high quality video tours and virtual tours and um, even uh, video conferencing for that matter. Um, and last week, uh, we launched a new feature uh, that gives realtors the option to include live stream open houses. Sometimes those are referred to as virtual open houses, but they're a bit more than that because they provide for interaction uh, between the consumer and the realtor during the open house itself. So we are now hosting those on realtor.com. Um, Realtor.com uh, is equipped and has um, opened live stream open house feeds uh, to the website from all MLSs that have mapped this data um, opportunity to our MLS feed. Um, and we are um, trying to promote that more and more um, so that um, MLSs know what they can do in that arena uh, for their brokers. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. We are asked from time to time um, with these new launchings, uh, some of them that are, um, have a focus for our current uh, environment, uh, what will stay and what is temporary, and that's always a hard question to answer. Um, the best answer is we're, we're always uh, now, last year, five years ago, uh, evaluating and evolving Realtor.com to better serve both consumers and the industry. And we will focus on what features and tools prove to be uh, most demanded uh, by the consumers uh, and equally important, uh, most used and appreciated by um, our realtors. Um, as you know, uh, buyers, sellers, and real estate professionals have greatly accelerated how they leverage virtual technologies. And in relative to what will stay and what might not stay, uh, we will continue always to create ways to leverage high tech in this high touch industry that real estate is. So this is that particular commitment certainly is here to stay. Um, we're also asked um, um, what our relationship is with MLSs and how we get these data feeds and, and make them work to the benefit of Realtor.com, uh, the benefit of the MLSs, the benefit of their um, customer base, and most important, the benefit of consumers. Um, and so um, one of the things that we've done over the past several months is um, put in place a number of additional fields uh, for listing display. Knowing that consumers now are working more than ever before uh, in a virtual environment uh, and trying to look at and understand what properties have to offer them. Um, we have uh, put in never, several new fields for display and we're busy informing MLSs of that and their leadership uh, so that we can get uh, those fields opened up to our MLS feed on Realtor.com. The MLSs have been extremely collaborative in this area and opening these fields, but there's still work to do and we're busy trying to accomplish that work uh, to the benefit of their subscribers. I had mentioned live stream open house features uh, earlier. Uh, relative to our relationship with MLSs, if your MLS has not yet um, mapped live stream open houses, uh, please work with your MLS vendor to make this data available in your realtor.com MLS feed. Um, our team uh, quickly maps it and makes it available on realtor.com. Usually that only takes a couple days, um, so that's something that we can accomplish very quickly once we know that the feed is there. Another thing we like to share, especially with MLS, is we have an outstanding customer care team at MLS support at realtor.com. Uh, they can help with any questions or additional support needs. Uh, my experience as I um, um, uh, send a lot of issues there for their assistance is they usually get it turned around within 24 hours, um, maybe 48 hours at the most to resolve questions and concerns that are there. And that gets right down to the agent level even. Uh, we're often they're busy. And we want uh, MLSs to know that um, and, and their leadership that we welcome their feedback to evolve features that help real estate professionals engage with home shoppers and sellers, uh, both effectively and safely. Um, I also wanna spend a few minutes on some new and free tools that we released, and I'm going to do that by way of live demonstration. Um, so uh, bear with me for a quick moment while I jump to that screen. 
Whoops. Here we go. Hopefully you're seeing this. Um, we launched uh, just a few weeks ago, a COVID-19 real estate resource center. Um, and it's launched to help the navigating the world of real estate during uh, these times that we're in right now. And uh, this resource center is about 45% information for consumers uh, to help them navigate their way through the real estate climate. So there's all sorts of resources down there and resources and information for them. They can load even more. Um, but we also have provide a lot of resources for real estate professionals. And if you click on this, you will jump to this screen here. Um, and this provides some of the resources that we make available to consumers. One is Easy Knock, which is a new um, partner we have uh, that creates an alternative style to sell your home but live in it for a while until uh, times change and you know more specifically what you might want to do. I'm gonna scroll down quickly here. Uh, there's a lot of resources here on best uh, practices for video tours, how to do uh, webinars, how to do uh, um, create videos um, that are going to buy an audience, our economic impact um, and resources, and all of that is readily available here. Uh, one other item that we have um, that is uh, pretty cool, I think, um, and I'm going to show you again a demonstration on that. Uh, let's see here. And that is um, our widget. Um, we've got a widget uh, that can be embedded on association, MLS, or broker websites. And in that widget, there's a lot of resources, uh, COVID-19 resources that I just showed you, access to that. Um, our content corner I'll show you briefly, how to maximize your profiles, um, TV ads, um, national housing forecast and virtual selling tips. Uh, most of these are very important in our current marketplace. So this is available. What I'm showing you is an example on a Pennsylvania Association website. These are really easy to implement. Um, let us know how we can help you accomplish that. And we'd like to make that happen for you as well. And lastly, um, a similar but different resource is our industry partner content corner uh, that we make available to associations and MLSs. Again, it has a lot of the same resources. It just makes it available in a different format um, where um, people can get the help they're looking for. One of the items on here that's not on the widget is our train the trainer programs, where we provide resources and um, slide decks for um, local trainers um, to be able to train their members on a lot of these things as well. So um, that's kind of a, a big picture overview of what we're working on. Um, it's very important to us, um, to, for you to know, uh, we are hard at work uh, to be your best business partners that we can be, um, that uh, Realtor.com remains committed to uh, evolving our features and our products and our experiences in ways that support agents and brokers' business success. So again, I thank you very much for your time and uh, pass the ball back to you. Great information, Mark. Great resources. A real example of leadership at a time when MLSs and the brokerage community need it. So thank you and thank everybody at Realtor.com for that. Next up, we have Charlie Lee. Charlie Lee is the Associate Counsel at the National Association of Realtors. Uh, Charlie's expertise ranges from contract review, go uh, corporate governance, cybersecurity, employment, antitrust, but none more important than being part of the MLS team at the National Association. That includes myself and Renee Galicia, uh, Team Ocho as we go by. Charlie's here to share with us information related to antitrust and this new virtual world that we're living in and some fair housing interests. Charlie? Thank you for that introduction, Rodney. It's always a privilege to ride yours and Renee's coattails. Um, so, can you guys see my screen okay? Yep, looks good. Yeah. All right, great. So, hi everyone. I hope you are safe and healthy, managing well during these unprecedented times. 
For this legal update, I will cover three topics, which are an update on the antitrust lawsuits, things to keep in mind while operating virtually, and fair housing. So with so much going on and changing due to this global pandemic, it's easy to forget what our lives look like pre-COVID-19. And unfortunately, uh, the antitrust lawsuits are something that still continues and we remain steadfast in defending the value of the MLS and our members. As a quick reminder, here's what happened so far in the cases. On March 6th of last year, one home seller and seven class action law firms filed a class action lawsuit in Illinois. About a month later, two more copycat lawsuits, uh, unsurprisingly, were filed, one in Illinois and another in Missouri. The main allegations in the complaints are that the sellers pay too much commission. The class action lawyers argue that NAR's MLS rule requires MLS participants to offer compensation to buyers, brokers, leading to artificially inflated and thus anti-competitive commissions being paid by consumers. They allege that the buyer's commission should be lower because essentially buyer's agents play a diminished, diminished role with the advent of the internet. Clearly this argument is flawed as it's based on the premise that everything on the internet can be trusted and is accurate and that little value is provided by the buyer's agent's services. In May, we filed a motion to dismiss the first action in Merle versus NAR. We think that our motion to dismiss demonstrated that the plaintiff's case was not legally viable. In response, the class action attorneys for the two lawsuits in Illinois combined forces and filed one consolidated amended complaint in June. Unsurprisingly, an amended uh, complaint was filed in Missouri in the Missouri case as well. While the new complaint presents additional allegations and slightly revised arguments, the underlying claims remain the same. The plaintiff's attorneys continue to misunderstand and mischaracterize the pro-competitive, pro-consumer MLS system, which is designed first and foremost with the best interests of buyers and sellers in mind. We filed motions to dismiss in each of the two cases. The motion in the Missouri case was denied in October. This wasn't a judgment on the merits of the case. Rather, the court basically was saying that there are enough, enough facts in the case for it to be further examined. Therefore, we are at the discovery stage in Missouri. In Illinois, we are still waiting for the judge's ruling on the motion to dismiss. In the meantime, the judge granted partial discovery. Discovery uh, is a process that entails compiling evidence from the parties and third parties. While this may be a long and expensive process that can take several years, we are committed and working to deny class certification and to also prevail on the merits of the litigation. As the legal battle continues in the courts, we continue efforts to battle in the court of public opinion. With our communications team, we're working to ensure that the public and specifically consumers know the truth about the value of the MLS and our members and how they're designed to serve the interests of home sellers and buyers. We believe this is an opportunity to show that realtors are champions of home ownership. The MLS system creates a pro-competitive and efficient market, which is the envy of every real estate market across the globe, and that brokers provide a valuable service that has been proven in studies. This is uh, the current status of the lawsuits, do check the NAR.realtor website and the hub for updates and new information. In my next topic, I'm going to provide some reminders of things brokers need to keep in mind as they operate in a virtual world. So the first is wire fraud. As of April 21, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center reported that they received more than 3,600 complaints related to COVID-19 scams. With so many transactions being handled virtually and remotely, it's highly important to keep your guards up. These criminals and hackers have no conscience even during a global pandemic and will not hesitate to exploit any opportunity they see. Therefore, remember to double check sender's email addresses and independently verify the identities of parties, monitor your email accounts for unrecognized activity, 
keep your operating system, anti-malware, and antivirus software up to date. Don't click on suspicious attachments and send sensitive documents carefully, preferably by using a transaction management system. The next reminder is about the ADA. As we rely more on technology to communicate and to provide services like virtual tours and virtual open houses, be sure that they're accessible to individuals with disabilities or provide reasonable accommodations. However, any accommodation should not require a broker or real estate professional to do anything in person which can risk their own personal health and safety. And the last reminder is to comply with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. The law prohibits telephone marketing, tel uh, tel telemarketing telephone calls, and text messages uh, made using automated telephone dialing equipment without adequate consent. For telemarketing text messages, which means it involves soliciting, encouraging the purchase, rental, or investment in property, goods, or services, you have to have prior written consent. If it's a non-telemarketing text, then prior express consent is sufficient. The TCPA is a strict liability statute that permits penalties of up to $1,500 per violation, and plaintiff's lawyers have made a lot of money filing TCPA lawsuits. So be sure to have the appropriate forms of consent if you are going to send any text messages using auto dialing equipment. My last topic is fair housing, specifically in relation to COVID-19. There's been much discussion and debate whether COVID-19 may be deemed a disability under the Fair Housing Act. This is an evolving area of the law and there, clearly, there currently is no clear answer. The courts may need to answer uh, this question. Nonetheless, it, it is prudent to treat COVID-19 as a disability just based on our research and assessment to avoid risks of violating the Fair Housing Act. We believe it is reasonable to encourage individuals to self-disclose their symptoms or to make a limited inquiry um, into whether the person is experiencing any symptoms from the virus. It's clear that the Fair Housing Act does not require real estate professionals to put themselves uh, in any direct uh, position of harm uh, to themselves or others. And COVID-19 is undoubtedly um, it presents a direct harm to others. So real estates should engage in an interactive process to determine if a reasonable accommodation can be provided to continue servicing a client or customer while mitigating any risk of health and safety uh, risks, such as by using virtual interactions or other suitable formats. If the individual does not agree to such accommodation and there is reasonable concern of a direct threat, to the health and safety of others, then the real estate professional should not feel obligated that they have to service the client or customer. A guidance that goes more in depth on the subject will soon be available on nar.realtor backslash coronavirus. This resource will be added to all other COVID-19 resources which are being constantly updated. Please make sure to check the website frequently for information and guidance to help manage uh, through the pandemic. So. This concludes my report and I will turn it back over. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. He hardly rides our coattails, by the way. He just keeps Renee and I out of trouble is what he does. Um, next up, last but not least, Danae Evans. Uh, Danae is the CEO for the Council of Multiple Listing Services. For those of you who don't uh, aren't as familiar with uh, CMLS as you should be, there's over 200 MLS providers that are members of CMLS uh, and they represent over 1.2 million uh, subscribers to the multiple listing service. Much like Mark, uh, Renee, you've been at it at this position for over five years. Right around that same time, NAR and CMLS entered into a formal uh, cooperation agreement with one another to leverage the strengths of our two organizations to best serve the industry. We've done a lot of great things over the past five years. We look forward to capitalizing on that and moving forward uh, to, re to, to build that up even more. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Danae so she can tell us about some of the great things that uh, CMLS has been doing. Danae. Excellent, thank you, Rodney, and- uh, I think Charlie, you can stop sharing your screen too. I was just gonna give the rest of the legal update. <laughs> 
Um, hello, everyone. My name is Danae Evans, and as Rodney said, the CEO of Council of Multiple Listing Services, or CMLS. And one second here, I'll get um, my screen up on there. I think we're going there. PowerPoint. And yes. All right. And that look. Okay. Um, so yes, we have had that partnership agreement and uh, for I think it's been about four years now and I think we've done some great things. So thank you to the MLS team at NAR and actually the whole team over there. You've been great to work with and I think we have accomplished a lot of excellent things. Um, my goal today is to share a little bit of what CMLS has, uh, some of the resources that we have uh, already established that I think are helpful in this current time, what we're currently working on, and just to share some resources that I think you'll find useful in our current time. So uh, Rodney did share with you the CMLS. We have 220 members and we do cover about uh, 1.3 million subscribers and we also have about 75 business partners. Uh, who contribute to to the community and helping us to um, provide information and best practices and resources to the industry. So I like to call it everything MLS. That's all we focus on and what we talk about is how to just best support the MLS industry. We originally started in 1957 as the Northwest Council of MLSs up in uh, uh, Sam's uh, part of the country and it evolved to much larger and, and now we have uh, Canada as well as uh, the US. So um, our focus is to, ad to advance MLSs who are looking to get better and showcase the, what is really working within the industry and really work to build a more vibrant, competitive and efficient marketplace that best supports brokers, agents and consumers. And we believe that MLSs today are really helping to make the market work now more than ever, their value and is what Charlie was talking about, the role that MLSs play just to really help connect um, people and, and continue to have some efficiency in the marketplace. So let me start a little bit with what we do have accomplished or what we have completed in the past. CMLS does have eight best practice areas and they are on our website that you can go at any time, councilofmls.org. Um, eight best practices, they're available to anyone who would like to use those finance, customer service, marketing, communication, all MLS based. This year we did do a new one on content management or CMPB because we all like our acronyms. And um, we also did an update to marketing and communications and technology best practices. So I would encourage you to use those and um, lots of resources on there. Another one, I don't know, I didn't put it on here, but you can see this partnering with data consumers. We did this a little while ago, but I think this is an excellent document if you're wanting to know where I said acronyms, but also our language, what, what words are we using and what do you call this, that, and the other thing. So uh, it can be very overwhelming. So I'd reference both of um, utilizing those tools that are in there. We also did a self-assessment was new this year. This is only available to CMLS members. It's an online uh, questionnaire that will help you to start assessing where your organization is, where you're doing really well, uh, and then also maybe identifying some places where you could do better or like you knew that maybe you should be doing that but you hadn't done it and just hadn't thought about it recently. So, but it is all based on those best practices. So whether you do the online tool as a CMLS member or you use the paper documents that are online, I would uh, request and ask that you uh, look at those if you find maybe you have a little extra time these um, coming up here. So with that, um, next, the leadership and governance survey. The purpose of doing this was that we wanted to uh, really highlight what leadership and governance looked like in MLS. And so we did this report. We also issued with it some hot topics, questions to be asking in your boardroom, some sample agendas using consent agenda for MLSs and really how we're seeing MLS governance evolve. And so a copy of that on here, but I wanted to point out in this, it was cracking me up. One of the questions, and at the time I thought was even bizarre, we asked how many of your board meetings are virtual? So I don't know if you can see this in there if my face is too small. 89% responded none. Um, I find that funny because <laughs> today we just flopped that. So everyone, it was even only 10% were even offering virtual meetings as an option. So how quickly we changed. But I thought this was a really great reference and example. Um, if looking at how have you set your organization up to be nimble and able to respond to a changing marketplace. So um, 
that also I put on here clear cooperation. Seamless was a huge supporter of this. We really appreciated uh, working with not only in the NAR, but also the industry of such a collaborative effort to create this and get to a really great place on uh, supporting keeping cooperation at the heart of our industry. And so, um, but my favorite was, and to hear Rodney talk about it, it got so many names, but my favorite was Ocho. So <laughs> team Ocho, I love that. Um, next, uh, typically CMLS does do a smaller conference right before the NAR events. We call it brings it to the table. It's the Tuesday before. This year we will be all meeting the same style virtually. We have set a date of May 21st from 12 to 4 p.m. Typically it's smaller. We usually have about 200 people in person. We did just open that back up. So if anybody would like to join us on that day, you can go to the CMLS website. We'd love to have you come talk MLS with us. Uh, there is a sample, or not a sample, a draft, not a draft agenda, an outline of agenda out there for you to look at, but we would love to have you join us and come uh, bring your conversations and topics to the table. Uh, normally we have a working lunch. Um, that you're going to have to bring your own lunch this time, though, so we're, we're not going to be able to provide that. The other thing that we do at CMLS, most of you probably know us for, is our conference. Um, as uh, referenced, Rezo just pulled off in 30 days going to a completely virtual conference. They did an excellent job. CMLS is currently having conversations of whether or not we're going to be in person. We're still trying to think positively, um, but we'll continue to monitor that. But either way, we will have our conference that will happen um, in uh, September 29th through October 1st, somewhere close to that if it's not in person, but um, it is all things MLS for typically a day and a half where we get together and talk and we will do our very best to still make sure that continues to happen. And um, next is our CMLS uh, training. We call it CMLX V and one. We do V, one, two, and three. Um, Three is our leadership, uh, um, executive level. Two is more upper management. And then we have V for volunteers and one is your basic information um, introduction to, to uh, MLS. So um, I have had so many people email me or text me, hey, can I get people signed up for this? Because this is a great way to increase your education and training. And we actually issue certifications for this. Um, I did want to share, I had one MLS exec tell me that they were actually looking to introduce, that were requiring uh, there, anybody who was applying to be on their MLS board of directors to complete the CMLXV training as a requirement to be on there because it is so important for today's MLS governance and leadership decisions to be some of the best of the best out there and really understand what's happening at the national level. So um, I love that idea and uh, happy to work, talk to anybody about that idea. And I think Rodney, Sam, Renee, you guys have all taken this. It's online self-paced training and it's a really great resource to have. Um, and the one, uh, CMLX one is for your, your, um, your MLS staff. Uh, next, um, CMLS did propose uh, an, a policy of broker data access. I do have it on the screen. We will be hosting, and I'll cover that in a minute. Um, uh, CMLS is hosting a webinar on Friday. We'll be discussing this a little bit in more detail, and I think you're looking for feedback I, um, on this, but um, I'm excited about this and uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with NAR and the community at, overall uh, on this topic. So I mentioned MLS Matters. This is every Friday CMLS has been hosting 90 minutes where about the first 30 to 45 minutes, we um, have people come together and talk and share on a specific topic. And then we push what I call the magic button and we all go into breakout rooms that have about 10 to 15 people. And you can just continue to talk about either the topic that was there or whatever is most important to you at that time. So please join us um, on Fridays. We would love to have you, but this Friday we'll be talking about the um, MLS policy and um, this one, we partnered with Rezo a little while ago. Sam, we did a, a survey of individuals, um, both organizations of what would make it more, uh, make it a little easier for people to access uh, MLS data. How do they get in touch with someone at the MLS? What is it they're looking to find? So there's the, you can see the results of the survey on there. And so CMLS just issued this, it's on our website. Our recommendations is a best practice for um, letting people be able to access the um, 
Speaking of lunch, Sam, my lunch is being delivered right now too. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. What did I get? Some vegetables. Um, <laughs> so, so that is on our website. And then um, as some best practices and options that, they, that can be used. And then I'll close out here really quick. Um, Charlie talked a lot about the value of the MLS and I just think so much, how much more important it is in our current environment. Making the market work, that is something CMLS launched in 2017. You can see some examples here of what some of our members have done using this, of just promoting um, competitors, gladiators, competing to make homeownership happen. That is the heart of cooperation of our industry that I just think is the most amazing little piece and the envy of the world, as you, as you described, Charlie. So we found that that was very industry focused. So um, CMLS decided we, we need to expand that and help make it a little easier to communicate that to the consumer. So we did do some research. My favorite little stat here, 24% thought that MLS stood for Major League Soccer. I feel like I run into those people more often than I would like to. Um, and so, um, but the biggest takeaway we had from it was that the consumer doesn't understand a lot of our industry language or our um, acronyms. So we are putting together, and I'm going to show you a little sneak peek of uh, the work that we're doing to have a campaign that is more consumer focused, that helps art clearly articulate that the value of the MLS to the consumer by way of bringing the realtor as part of that process or the center of that process to help the consumer find that perfect home by using the MLS marketplace. So um, with that, I'll show you this little peek here. Are you in the market? Are you on the market? How do you know what's going on? because we are the multiple listing service. So little sneak peek there. Uh, we'll be coming out with some more of that in the, over the next uh, couple of months. And that is my update for the Council of Multiple Listing Services. And thank you very much for, for having me today. Thanks so much, Danae. Great information. And I'll point out that I think everything you just went over is new since you came on board, right? That, that it's, it's my opinion, and I, I think I'll get a lot of head shakes from everybody who knows Danae, that really Danae and the leadership of CMLS has taken that organization to a whole new level uh, when it comes to services and products and, and what they do for the industry. So Thank Danae, you, you and your staff, hats off to you guys. You guys operate like a staff that's two to three times the size that you are. <laughs> we Thank have you. great support and great partners, so that, that helps to make a So Renee, that kind of concludes my introduction of our, uh, of our esteemed panel here. Uh, great information. Thank you so much for being our uh, industry partners and for uh, being part of this webinar today uh, and for pushing our industry forward. While across the country, a number of us are on lockdown orders, our business isn't, right? And it's more important now than ever that we all step forward and see what we can do to help the practitioners out in the field. So hats off to you guys. Uh, be safe, be well. Renee, I'm going to turn it over to you to close us out. Thank you, Rodney. And again, just to reiterate, thank you everyone for participating today. For those of you watching, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, Rodney, Charlie, or any of our wonderful panelists. Uh, we're all here to assist you. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the next uh, meeting. Thank you, everyone. Take care.